Top of the morning, Dan and Amy Barry Weiss, former New York Times columnist. Her um, resignation letter sent to New York Times publisher A.G. Salzberger that has gone viral because it is uh, a withering and seemingly spot-on critique of what the New York Times has become. I thought this uh, sentence was particularly salient. A new consensus has emerged in the press, but perhaps especially at this paper. The truth isn't a process of collective discovery, but an orthodoxy already known to an enlightened few whose job is to inform everyone else. Yes, the vanguard class, and you're not in it. Uh, she goes on to say, Twitter is not on the masthead of the New York Times, but Twitter has become its ultimate editor. As the ethics and mores of that platform have become those of the paper, the paper itself has increasingly become kind of a performance space. Stories are chosen and told in a way to satisfy the narrowest of audiences rather than allow a curious public to read about the world and then draw their own conclusions. And remember the backdrop of this as she reminds us. The 2016 election, where the D.C. press corps was dumbstruck at the outcome how could this happen in my America? They were one big collective Pauline Kale. I don't know anybody who voted for Nixon. <laughs> he won 49 states, Pauline. That says something about your circle, not about the country. And so I don't know anybody who voted for Trump was the updated refrain from all of these D.C. press corps panjan drums. And so they were going to commit themselves to get outside of their bubble to go find out what is happening in the rest of America, find out who these people are who live in these faraway lands named Michigan and Wisconsin and <laughs> Iowa, how they live, Kansas. what yes. they look like. What is your daily routine? Uh, and uh, try to get a better understanding of how these people could not follow the lead of Dean Beckett and the rest of the jet set on the eastern seaboard. And that lasted for a little bit. And then the decision was made to scrap that and just become openly hostile. And as Barry Weiss suggests, uh, establish a orthodoxy that is to be enforced. And she's just tired of, I guess, operating in a newsroom where her colleagues call, as she says, call her a Nazi and a racist. I have learned to brush off comments about how I'm Writing about the Jews again, quote, unquote. That sounds like a very pluralistic, tolerant, thoughtful newsroom, a work environment, doesn't it? Is that a work environment that would be tolerated anywhere else in the country other than a newsroom or perhaps a, a poli sci department on campus? Remarkable development uh, made all the more poignant by Andrew Sullivan's resignation from New York Magazine. <laughs> where he said, uh, why, makes you laugh. why did he, why did he, why'd you resign, Andrew? I think it's pretty self-evident. <laughs> if you don't know why I resigned, then you're not paying attention to what's happening. Yes. For more on this and a couple of other topics, we're pleased to be joined by David French, senior editor at the Dispatch, columnist for Time, and author of Divided We Fall, America's Secession Threat and How to Restore Our Nation, which is scheduled for release September 22nd of this year. David, thanks for joining us again. Appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, your comment on the departure of Barry Weiss and Andrew Sullivan from the, their lofty posts at uh, the New York Times and New York Magazine, respectively. Yeah, I mean, this is what this is further evidence of what we're seeing about formerly liberal institutions becoming bastions of illiberalism. I mean, this is you know, look, we all know that the New York Times is a progressive publication. However, for many years, uh, it has at least attempted and, and it has accomplished it in some ways more than publications. And its editorial pages has printed a variety of perspectives, has hired people, including the rarest of rare birds of all uh, in mainstream media, an outright social conservative, Ross Dowsett, who's uh, fortunately still there. Um, it has printed a, a variety of, of opinions. It, it brought in Barry Weiss, who was a tremendous hire, in, not just because of what she wrote uh, when she was at the Times. 
she was also an editor who solicited other pieces, who solicited other um, other op-eds from other writers. I worked with her uh, to put out a post on uh, free speech on social media or put out a piece on free speech and social media while she was there. Uh, and so she was determined to introduce diverse voices to The New York Times. And what was remarkable about it is how viciously, how viciously she was vilified from within and without uh, the newspaper. I mean, just absolutely vicious. Sure, fine, disagree with her. She welcomed disagreement. But that's the ominous thing here. It isn't just that these formerly liberal institutions are becoming more illiberal. It's they are becoming more illiberal in, uh, in a manner that reflects often cruelty and malice. And it's a cruelty and malice that radiates out of its pages towards the rest of the country. And, and again, look, this is the New, York, the New York Times is a private entity. It has the right, if it wants to become the nation, um, it can become the nation. If it wants to become like Mother Jones, it can become like Mother Jones. But I would submit that our country loses something. Uh, and it loses something important when these former bastions of American lib small l liberalism um, start to become uh, not just r radically ideological, but often maliciously radically ideological. Well, well I mean, considering the way she was being treated by her colleagues, are you surprised she didn't resign earlier? No, I mean, I very I tough. <laughs> very tough. You know, she can she can take a lot. Uh, I, I've known her i've known of her for a long time she stood up to a firestorm and when she was a student at columbia when she called out some pretty grotesque anti-semitism by some professors at the university uh and she's faced a firestorm there too so she she's tough but you know you can only you know you can only be isolated in your own institution for so long and and one of the most poignant aspects of her letter was when uh she basically said to her bosses not only did you know but you supported me with your private words, but you never could really muster up the gumption to take on the people who were uh, trashing her inside the newspaper. And, you know, I look forward to reading Andrew Sullivan's words about New York. Um, and look, I know that Barry's going to land on her feet and people will continue to read her. I know Andrew Sullivan will land on his feet and people will continue to read him. The point isn't, are Barry or Andrew Sullivan canceled? The point is, what is becoming of these institutions? Do we have places in this country where people on the left and on the right uh, can engage in dialogue uh, and where there isn't just relentless ideological groupthink on opposing sides of the spectrum? Well, I mean, I, th well, I think it's both. I mean, I think, you know, the individuals matter, the institutions matter too. Um, the, the Andrew Sullivan's response was interesting. He said, um, I think Barry Weiss's future is a lot brighter than the future of the New York Times. Do you agree? I'm not sure. I'm so sure I agree. Uh, I'm not sure. Sure, I agree either. I mean, look, and you know, if you want to look at other liberal institutions that have really become ideological monocultures to an extreme degree, it's not like fewer people are trying to get into Harvard or Yale. Um, mm -hmm. It's not like fewer people are trying to get into Stanford. These institutions have centuries of prestige built up in them and wrapped up in them. Um, and which is why, you know, people say the New York Times is over, the New York Times is over. That's really premature. I would just say that the New York Times is becoming a worse force in our nation and our culture than it was before. And that's that's what's ominous about it. You know, if you go to if you go to Harvard um, and, you know, there's some recent data showing that, that, you know, regarding the ideological composition of Ivy League faculties, you're going to be exposed to an awful lot of groupthink, and it's not that Harvard isn't Harvard anymore as far as the prestige of the degree or the desire to attain the prestige of the degree. It's just that Harvard is not – in many ways has become a negative influence and a negative force in, within American society because of its illiberalism um, and because of its increased illiberalism, and that, that, that's the problem. It's not like New York Times is going to wither and go away. Um, it's arguably got more – I believe it's got more paid subscribers than it's ever had. It's that what is this doing to us? Yeah, and uh, last uh, – Reason Magazine uh, has the story. Uh, last Until last week, Gary Garrels was a senior curator of painting and sculpture at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. Not anymore. He resigned his position after museum employees circulated a petition that accused him of racism, demanding his immediate ouster, of course. 
uh, that it, the his removal was non-negotiable. Read the petition. Is anything negotiable with them? Um, and um, the uh, the petitioner cited a few examples uh, that uh, to make their case for why he needs to be removed. Basically, uh, he um, uh, said that he is going to continue to collect art, including from white artists. And obviously, there you go. Uh, uh, <laughs> I rest my case, Your Honor. Gary Garrels has to be removed. How dare he say that he, they will still continue to collect art from white artists, uh, apparently suggesting that he's going to collect art based on the quality of the art, and there's no room for that sort of meritocratic speak in America. And well, you know, I want to – well, let's note real quick. How much do these how much do these controversies have to do with police brutality and civil rights in the United States? Like this this is one thing that's absurd about a lot of this cancel culture now is that you've had you had this awful George Floyd killing. Um, you had a lot of concern for civil rights in uh, policing, and then it suddenly turns into this hyper elite progressive navel gazing that is doing what exactly? You know what? What does that really do for racial justice? That that is, you know, if you, if you're concerned about real issues in the United States of America, all of a sudden cancel culture, this elite progressive fratricidal movement, is completely now dominating the national conversation. It's yeah. it's remarkable. And and so doesn't it speak to the fact that of course it's not about racial justice at all. It's about political power, and uh, uh, what you have. Uh, which is really concerning, in addition to pr professionals uh, who shouldn't have their careers torn asunder so cavalierly, you have uh, institutions, so the arts, media, you were just talking about uh, elite academic institutions, all coming together to enforce this orthodoxy that Barry Weiss spoke about in her resignation letter. Um, what road is it that we're on, do you think? <laughs> Well, you know, we're at a pivotal moment, and I do think that there are a, a lot of people, and, and you saw this happen with the publication of the letter at Harper's, which Barry and I believe Andrew Sullivan also signed, declaring allegiance to free speech and open debate. You've seen this in the founding of uh, the Yasha Monk new online community called Persuasion, where a lot of people who are left-leaning, smaller liberals are now saying, whoa, stop this. And that's honestly what it's going to take. I mean, Illiberalism on the left is not is not confronted and defeated by the right. It has to be confronted and defeated by small L liberals on the left. Just like illiberalism on the right is not going to be confronted and defeated by uh, left liberals. It's got to be taken on by classical liberals on the right, and that's be what's beginning to happen. Um, and and I think the outcome is in doubt. I do think that there are a lot of people who are sick of this. Um, I talk to them all the time. They're sick of it, but they don't yet stand up, and that is, that's what's got to happen. Um, I think at, at uh, many of these Ivy League schools, a very small percentage of the student body dominates the ideological uh, debate. Well, uh, I think yeah. in these newsrooms, it's a minority that dominates the ideological debate. And, and Nikki Haley just and, wrote yesterday, you know, we have 1 percent of the population screaming at 99 percent of the population that they're thinking wrong. Well, that's interesting, and I don't know what the percentages are, but I do know that in history, it's always moved by the committed few for good or for bad. So, I mean, the fact that's that true. it's that the fact that it's a minority, it is not much comfort to me because it's always a minority. But you know, that's the word is committed. So, you know, I'm I have a lot of friends who um, are sick of this and are growing in their commitment to combating it and. And I think that they have the better argument. I mean, they have the argument that's actually where more people are. And can the committed few within these institutions and who are adjacent to these institutions rise up? And that's why, you know, I think the Harper's letter was a really pretty pivotal moment because this wasn't just your standard collection of libertarians and, and conservative free speech activists. The letter included Noam Chomsky and Gloria Steinem for crying out loud. And, and these, yeah. these were people who were who are saying enough of this. And you see now on uh, online, there is a fierce battle between left-leaning thinkers about this Barry Weiss incident. And, and you wouldn't have seen that a year ago. Uh, so yeah, I do but, believe. I, sorry to interrupt, but yeah, but that battle is, seems to be over the targets, not necessarily the practice. 
I don't know. I think that, that enough, there's an enough uh, intolerance. And a lot of this, y'all, has been this blue-on-blue blue stuff that we've seen, like taking on museum curators with impeccable liberal credentials because they you know, didn't properly phrase their condemnation of, of racism. Uh, so you've had a lot of this blue-on-blue blue fratricide in the last uh, six months or so. And uh, look, I, I, have, I, have, I have had a um, Democratic professor say to me not long ago, I, I tenured in the Ivy League, so they, they have about the best job security in the whole world, say, I'm, I'm really terrified of my students. Yeah, and, yeah. And, uh, they, they see what happens to Joshua Katz. Yeah, they see what happens to yeah. Joshua Katz. They're saying it to you, and they're probably saying it at a whisper level. The problem is mm-hmm. you don't have enough people standing up. And so, I mean, so help me reconcile this, because I want to fold in this other piece you wrote. The case for religious liberty is more compelling than the case for Christian power. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I get the point that you're making about religious liberty, and you, you make the su- suggest, um, and there's some evidence to support it, of course, that religious liberty is more uh, expansive today than it was, say, 30 years ago. But but I mean, why don't we want Christian values reflected in our political halls of power? I mean, consistent with those values that were the foundation of our uh, of of the nation's well, birth. Uh, I mean, I I'm if this is a struggle for if this is a I mean, just let me if this is a struggle for power in a sense, then should we unilaterally disarm as Christians? Well. I didn't say that it's a struggle between religious liberty and Christian values. Um, it was the question, the, the uh, word phrase was Christian values to reflect that Christians still have to make the case for the power that they seek. And some of them, quite frankly, don't. And they do it very poorly, and we don't want them anywhere near power, but unfortunately they have it. If you had a Venn diagram, for example, of the number of people who, say in their Twitter bio, say, put, uh, you know, conservative, Christian, MAGA, and then they're also running around trying to uh, argue that masks are an infringement on your civil liberties and that are condemning the Gates vaccine. I mean, it's a high overlap. So what we have to do when you're talking about who is in power, see, liberty is a right. I have, a, I have an unalienable right to religious liberty as articulated in the First Amendment. The bid for power has to be justified. Yes. I don't have to justify an exercise of a right. Right. But a lot of Christian conservatives, rather than advancing Christian values, are running around advancing MAGA, and I don't see those as the same thing. All right. We'll have to leave it there. David French, senior editor at The Dispatch, columnist for Time, author of Divided We Fall, America's Secession Threat and How to Restore Our Nation, which releases November, uh, excuse me, September 22nd of this year. I'm sure you can pre-order it at all the usual places. David French, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks, and he joined us on our turnkey.proanswerline. Listen to-